the soft skills, what they call soft skills, that I'm also trying to incorporate into these tracks by having the web presence that you develop and by having the capstone project where you have to basically defend your, you know, your whole year. <laughs> Those are about the soft skills. Those are about, you know, how you and I talk and how people present at base conventions and all of these different things. I am such a fan of today's guest, and it has been so fun to have her on the podcast multiple times at this point. This is maybe her fourth time on the podcast. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are talking today with Susan Cahill of the Lamont School of Music at the University of Denver. She's also a member of the Colorado Symphony and does so many other things that we have talked about on the podcast. We've done a live show with her. I Anybody who comes on the podcast multiple times, it's because they're doing interesting things, and Susan keeps doing interesting things, so <laughs> you're going to be hearing more of her in the future. People who do interesting things tend to do more interesting things, I have found. But I'm rambling. What we're talking about today is how Susan is reinventing the traditional senior recital with her bass student. We've got links with all the specifics about what we're talking about, so you can check out the show notes and follow along. But Susan has taken the senior recital, and in addition to having the option of a traditional recital, that's still there, Susan is offering the following options. Composition for bassists, multi-instrumental techniques for bassists, chamber techniques for bassists, orchestral auditioning for bassists, not-for-profit study for bassists, pedagogy and studio creation for bassists. How cool is that? And I get so inspired by talking to people at any time, but especially during a global pandemic, about how they are rethinking their craft, their teaching. Love this conversation. Quick shout out to our sponsors, Dorico, Ear Trumpet Labs, Practisma, and Modacity. More on them in a bit. But let's dive into this conversation with the wonderful Susan Kay. How's life? You know, crazy. <laughs> How's it going for you? Fine. I'm still locked away in my condo, just like I was like however many months ago we were last talking. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it was like April or something. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like kind of right after everything went down. I know. It's yeah. just crazy. It's crazy. I know. I know. So, and we're, we're like, do we cancel Christmas plans? Uh, probably we were going to, my mom was going to fly from South Dakota to, to Oregon. And then we were going to fly up and it looks like California and Oregon are on the fence of just w- way shutting down. So yeah. um, more, more of this condo. That's okay. At least San Francisco has nice weather. <laughs> That's right. And it's a nice time of year to be there, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. This is like the not foggy part time of year, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like okay. October, November, and luckily, knock on wood, it seems like the fire season has hopefully yeah. passed us. So, yeah, no, it's like the high is 70 today and it's, uh, nice. you know, that kind of that kind of thing. Yeah, we actually managed to spend a few nights in San Francisco after um, I went to California for San Luis Obispo, the Festival Mosaic. And we stayed at the um, that hotel right there in Union Square where they wash the pennies. What's the name of that place? Oh, I'm thinking on it. It's a Westin now, but it's a famous old hotel. Yeah, they're all the hotels around that that Union Square are are beautiful. And then up on Knob yeah. Hill, another you got the Fairmont, where I think the UN was started, right? if I remember right. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, no, we, we we drove past that. Actually, a friend of ours gave us a private tour mm-hmm. in a in a Tesla X. Like it was it was very cool. Wow! So my kids and I and Scott, we just did this private tour of San Francisco, which of course was deserted. I mean, there's was nobody around. <laughs> Um, but it was great. It was, we had a great time, actually. Well, next time you're so, out here post-pandemic, let me take you around uh, North Beach and the, all the old beatnik ho- hood uh, places yeah. that where we live. So it's, I would uh, have, yeah, I love that. I mean, it's just it was just you know traveling. We were driving, of course, from Colorado, and just traveling was sketchy all summer. It just felt like mm-hmm. you were rolling the dice every time you pulled into a gas station, or you know, it just <laughs> it was a little unnerving. Yeah. Um, so, but it was still a good trip. So nice. I haven't, yeah. left, I haven't left the city of San Francisco since, since March 10th or whatever. So it's, wow. <laughs> I, we, I, I'm getting a little stir crazy, but, uh, I you bet. know, we'll see. Oh but my if, gosh. If you have yeah. to trap somewhere, at least there's enough nature in the city itself. And right. I just, you know, so right. here, here we are, but yeah. So how's your, how's your wife doing? Is she, uh, she's probably working really hard, huh? Yeah. It's just business as usual at the hospital. So like Rachel, radiology scan you know scans continue unabated so there's just more mm-hmm. like waiting in line to get into the hospital you know for the for the doctor
actors. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. no, it's fine. They put it, they, they stationed her. You could choose there. There are several locations of UCSF and you could choose for the, this, however long this pandemic goes on where you want to go. So there's one that's pretty close to us. Her, mm -hmm. her office is at the main location, which is a little bit further away. And so she's okay. been biking or walking or taking a quick Uber ride down there. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it's, good. That's it's nice. Fine. Yeah. Try to keep myself yeah. busy with projects. Uh, like, like you, I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, I, I've been lucky. I've been busier than, than a lot of folks. Um, the symphony is actually, we're actually on payroll right now. Um, they're doing mostly recordings uh, for the Christmas time and stuff like that. Um, and I did a big education video um, for like beginning, intermediate, advanced on bass. Um, so we're all doing kind of different things depending on how they need us and, and people's comfort level, which is nice. This orchestra is saying, you know, if you have a immunocompromised person, if you are yourself, um, you tell us that and we'll work around that. So, man, I'm pretty grateful about that. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah, it's been pretty quiet on the San Francisco Symphony front. I don't know what's happening. I do. I do believe they want to do something with Esa Pekka Solonen since he's this is his first year as music director. What a what a year to start <laughs> to take right. over. Um, but I oh think I, I, I don't I haven't heard anything from anybody in the orchestra in terms of if what they're doing at present. But um, yeah, so oh. we'll, we'll see. Okay, that's too bad. Yeah, I guess now that you think of it, I haven't either. I mean, in terms of things going across my news feed on Facebook, it's like Dallas. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen stuff from St. Paul. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've seen stuff from Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's definitely not everybody. There's there's definitely folks lying low yeah. for right now. I don't yeah. know if L.A. Phil has done anything either. I'm trying to think of the, the big California orchestras have. I, I haven't seen anything. I could just not be paying attention, but I, I figured I would have yeah. seen something. So we'll we'll see. Right. Well, right, well, it's, right. Funny, it's funny. You and me talking back in April, you were said you said a line which I've actually quoted a few times. I'll probably butcher, but it was something like music's going to come back, but probably not probably in small groups first. And, right. And that is totally the case here in San Francisco. I finally mm -hmm. have started to see some live music. And luckily, we live in a climate where you can you can be outside. You might get rained on if you don't have shelter, but you can theoretically play outside. So it's been nice to see actually a lot of the small venues like jazz clubs and places where rock groups play it's like the bands indoors and everybody else is outside they just open right. up all the windows which is a, kind of a funny mm -hmm. way to do it but it, it works whatever works you know i um you know i, I have a small concert series mass eclectic a not-for-profit and i've just decided i'm gonna i'm just gonna transpose the season to start at the end of march which is when here you can reliably get at least a few days mm -hmm. uh and then go through october Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, if we do have the vaccine by April and most people are vaccinated, then it can just start up again, you know, in the winter or in the fall, whenever I decide to do that. Yeah. Um, and I just that seems to me like the smart thing to do. It's like turn turn your spring season, turn your fall season into your spring se season and summer season. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's the that's the plan as of today. <laughs> it might change, but <laughs> well, you you seem like someone who has been, and it's great that the that the Colorado Symphony is back up and and people are on payroll. That's that's wonderful mm -hmm. to hear. But yeah, you're you've got such a diversified career, uh, mm -hmm. it, it may, and it might be surprising for I'll obviously link up to our other other conversations. But like someone who has a full time orchestra job, it's pretty cool. And the university teaching, you have all these other things that you do. And then I love right. looking at this at this uh th th what you're doing at the Lamont School and providing mm -hmm. all these tr these six tracks and what a cool yeah. idea and you were thinking about that pre-pandemic anyway right yeah okay I really was I this is something I've been wanting to initiate for a long time and but the pandemic gave me this great opportunity to with this people kind of administration and the and the rest of the string faculty kind of having more open minds about what it's going to take um, to educate the students now. And so, yeah, I developed uh, six tracks uh, that are in, that can be in place of a typical uh, treble based senior recital. And those six tracks will include, it's a kind of a three part thing. They'll, they'll be a capstone project. There'll be um, web-based integration for whatever your track is. And then there'll be the recital itself. So I've actually given myself like three extra jobs, <laughs> <laughs> but it's what it's, it's what I believe is is needed. Mm -hmm. 
um, because I'll be teaching all of this. And um, and so when I was thinking about what to offer besides a basic treble based recital, Bottasini, a sonata, maybe some Bach, um, I thought about what my portfolio career looks like in addition to the symphony and the types of things I do. So I came up with basically the six things that I do. No surprise. So there's a composition track where you can combine bass playing with, with your composing. There's a multi-instrumental track, which that's one of my favorites because I play a lot of different instruments and I like the idea of teaching music I mean, I always, I've always said one of my best early bass teachers was my piano teacher and because she's the one who taught me basic musicianship concepts that you can apply to any instrument. So if someone is interested in either performing on more than one instrument or even just exploring enriching their bass playing through another instrument, um, I'm all for that. I think that's awesome. So there's that track. Then there's a chamber music track, which of course is something I also do a lot of. And in years past, it was really hard for me to convince um, faculties that um, chamber music should be a big part of any recital for bass. They really just wanted to hear solo pieces. And um, first of all, you know, bass players don't get a huge opportunity to play a lot of solo pieces in their career. Uh, and if they do, it's usually something either they've arranged or it's an extra thing, an extra beautiful thing, but it's not how we're putting food on the table. So the chamber music track is something that actually really speaks to something that we do get a chance to do if we're lucky and that we can create much more easily than we can create a solo career for ourselves. Um, then there's a, a traditional orchestra audition track, which um, I love. Um, I love teaching that more specifically. And then there's also a not-for-profit track where you can combine your ideas about what you want to do with your career in the entrepreneurial world with your bass playing, um, which is also something I've done. And then the last one is pedagogy and studio creation, which can be any kind of studio. Be it you want to learn how to be an effective university professor or a Vance teacher or Suzuki teacher. Now, I'm, I'm not certified to teach Suzuki. Um, or, or, you know, whatever certifications come with Vance, but I've certainly done it all. I've taught them all. I've taught all the methodologies. So, um, and I've created a studio, a home studio. So um, these were, like I said, these are just the things that I do that I figured would work really well with a lot of traditional repertoire. It will take some time out of the traditional repertoire portion of the recital. Um, but it won't take any emphasis off of actual bass playing. I was thinking about this earlier, you know, if, if, if Bruce Bransbeer or Larry Hurst found out that I was shirking my responsibilities of teaching good technique, I know they'd just, they'd find me and kick my butt. I know they would. <laughs> right. so, so that's just not going to happen. Um, and I feel really grateful that, that I get to combine that kind of approach to teaching that I got at, at, from those two very, very fine gentlemen. Um, with all of this, I feel super lucky and I'm really, really excited about this prospect of offering this. There are so many things to think about when you're practicing. Where do you even begin? Here is Modacity founder and CEO Mark Gelfo on what to prioritize in your practicing. First things first, you got to measure time. Time is of the essence. You want to get the highest return on your time investment. And the way to do that is through listening to yourself and self-recording. Almost everybody who reads the blogs, blogs of Rob Knopper, Noah Kagayama, everybody knows self-recording is absolutely essential. So we put it front and center along with time. Recording yourself, measuring the time you've spent on particular sections, and so many other things are available in Modacity. I love this app so much. You can learn more at modacity.co. And if you visit our website, we've got a special offer for lifetime access to the app. Check it out. You'll love it. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. This episode is brought to you by Ear Trumpet Labs. These are hand-built microphones out of Portland, Oregon, and they make an excellent mic for upright bass called Nadine. Barry Green got to try out this mic at our 2020 Online Bass Summit, where Ear Trumpet Labs was a sponsor, and he was singing its praises all weekend long. It's an instrument-mounted condenser mic with an incredibly clear, natural sound and great feedback rejection. It's durable and works with in-ears, monitors, you name it. Not to mention, Christian McBride, Barry Bales, and Missy Raines are all Nadine users. 
works. Whether it's classical jazz, Americana, or bluegrass, this mic seriously delivers, and they're offering a free t-shirt, especially to Contrabass Conversations listeners with a purchase of a mic. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash to claim yours and check out Nadine. Well, it's exciting to me to see people finding new ways to teach and doing things that you'd probably want to be doing anyway, but the, just the, the velocity of life, it's tough to like take some time and, and really think through it and plan it out. And I love how so much of this is involved with creating something new, which I find really exciting. It's something that I've thought about so many times on gigs. I'm playing this, I, I played this chamber music festival up in Northern Wisconsin for years and years. And that was started by Jim and Jean Birkenstock from Lyric Opera. And I thought they've created this, you know, into, you know, couple million dollar uh, funded, you know, annual event. I played another, uh, the, the Symphony 2, Chicago Philharmonic, again, another thing created by Jim and Gene. And, and it's so cool to see people, and I've been talking to some people during the pandemic that have started nonprofits, and it's just so cool to see people create something, whether it's, uh, you know, an orchestra like the Colorado Symphony or a chamber music series or a teaching studio. It's just exciting to bring something new into the world rather than that sort of musician mindset that so many people fall into where they're battling for the same resources. Right. And that, that battling for the same resources, I mean, we're actually, I know this is going to sound cracked, but I think students now have a better ability to branch out if they don't want to get into that battle. Now, clearly I did. And I went on the audition circuit and got a job, but what I didn't have back then was the ACA. Okay. And one of the main drivers for me getting an orchestra job wasn't just that I love orchestra, but I'm like, I got to provide for the family. I have to have benefits. You know, I have to have health care. And now that it looks pretty clear that the ACA isn't going away, I think, I think students should have a lot more freedom in terms of how they think about their career. Um, and also, like you said, with all these people starting these new ventures, all these great resources for starting a not-for-profit that are everywhere. I was just at the um, the uh, Women in Classical Music Symposium that the Dallas Symphony held a few day, uh, last week. And so much good stuff going on in terms of people starting up organizations for music and social justice and um, DEI initiatives, all kinds of great stuff going on. So I just... I mean, if I had if I had that resource, all these resources back then, I'm not sure if I would have kept grinding away at the audition circuit. I, I think I love playing in the orchestra, but we have to be realistic. You know, we need musicians. That's clear. But how many orchestral musicians are we going to need? Um, that is the question. Right, right. And it's such a tricky balance because obviously, like you said, you, you, you don't want Bruce Ban Bransby to come back and kick your butt for not no, training people. And there's beauty <laughs> in like developing an Olympic level skill in anything. But and, yeah. and, and, you know, playing your instrument doesn't matter what you're going to do with that. That's a beautiful thing. Getting to the height of, a, of a, uh, some sort of professional activity and you can transfer so many of those lessons over. But it's really it's really cool. You know, I've, I've been so envious for so long about uh, colleagues in Europe, right, that have that benefits more built in. And so it's great to see that we were at least head, headed that direction a lot more than we were when I was in my 20s. Um, you just, you, 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 it gives you the opportunity to take a chance and try and not, you know, right. have to worry so much about if you break your leg or you get into a car accident or any health condition rises up. Right. And I think it's a, it's a great time to take a chance too, because the, the playing field has gotten incredibly level all of a sudden, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and things that really did look like a, a sure thing, maybe not as much as they did. And so for me, I think it's a, it's a wonderful time to break down barriers for creativity for however you want to be a musician in this world. And I will say that, you know, of my many orchestral colleagues that I know and love, um, the happiest ones are the ones who have enriched their playing beyond orchestra, you know? Um, and it's not like they show up at their orchestra and say, oh, here's my day gig, you know, this is really a grind, I really hate it. It's not that, it's, but all the things they do outside of the orchestra are so helpful. And, and really your senior year in college, while you could be, you know, really hammering away at the excerpts, you could also do that in the two years of graduate school. And you could go see Paul Ellison or you could go see Tim or you could go see a lot of these folks and they will just, you know, hand it to you and it'll be great and you'll love it. 
Um, my thinking for doing this earlier was to make sure that people were really aware of the choices and also t- were more informed when they started to practice these excerpts. I mean, if you have a kid, let's say a kid comes in and wants to do the, the multi-instrumental track and they, they want to learn an early Beethoven sonata, you know, I, I can help them with that. I can teach them what the phrasing means when you're, when you're clearly so concerned about the everything from the melodic line to the harmony line. So um, I just, I just think it'll actually help um, folks in their audition process. Cause I know for myself, man, when I started auditioning, I was already pretty burned out. I was already pretty burned out. And, um, but I just was too scared to think about doing any kind of diverting type activity. Um, and so this is, this is my response to that. Yeah, it's interesting how, I mean, I, I, I guess if you zoom out, you might realize, oh yeah, th- this is true, but, it, but people sort of forget about how real burnout is. I was just talking mm-hmm. with my, my former student, Ian Hallis, who is principal base of Lyric Opera now, and he mm. has won four auditions in Lyric in the last four years. You know, went from wow, section to this awesome. to this. And, and, and I was just talking about, what's it like auditioning for the same dang job four times <laughs> in a row? And he was right. just talking about burnout and how real that was. And a big difference yeah. between that first audition and the last last couple is like he's just trying to realize those signs you think you just got to go 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 you know push 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 um but uh, the that that way is not the way so often well it works for some people some yeah. people are, are able to be that single-minded and for other people you hear that in the audition itself you know um and i'm i've sat, sat on enough committees to be able to recognize when someone has boxed everything in perfectly but their playing doesn't move me at all. And as I've often told people who've auditioned for our orchestra, you know, we've, we've never hired the loudest player, not one time. (laughs) Um, We've never hired the fastest player. We've never hired the person who's been, um, you know, everything note perfect, but, but just a cardboard replica of what the music should be. So I think we have to kind of change the narrative for a lot of students. And this is, this is part of that. This is part of why I wanted to do this. And all of these six tracks, there's still some solo bass playing, some bass playing in all yes. of them. Yeah. Yes. Like 10 oh, minutes absolutely. Or, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. No, I mean, it depends on the track, but most of them have a, have a good majority of solo bass playing. But for instance, if you're doing the composition track, it could mostly be your own music. Um, And I think the junior recital is, I really want students to kind of decide by junior year so that we can turn towards this as as we finish up the junior recital and go into the senior recital. And the junior recital um, will be much more of a traditional, okay, let's make sure we've got covered what you think you need to have covered, what I think you need to have covered. In your in your work, so that when we move forward, we know if which gaps to fill with the rest of that solo repertoire. And you know, my other thing is, I, I just had a student did the um, the proto sonata, and my other thing is to making sure that they can be expressive in the lower registers, you know, which that piece certainly is, and a lot of pieces are. Um, so that that becomes something that they take into their everyday bass playing. They don't just become a lyrical musician when they get above the harmonic G. This episode is brought to you by Dorico. And one of the things that attracted me so much to this app is the beautiful user interface. Here's Daniel Spreadbury, Senior Product Manager, on how they thought about designing this user interface. It was building on that idea of, of having everything in its place and a place for everything, basically, and not just throwing everything at the screen and hoping that you'd be able to find your way through it. I have become a true fan of Dorico. I have the full version. I use it every single day. I use it in my lessons. I use it for, uh, I have become such a fan of Dorico. I use it every single day. I use it in my lessons. I use it for making arrangements and exercises and everything like that. There is a free version SE, Dorico SE, and you can do everything practically that the full version of the software lets you do. So if you're doing arrangements for a student, duets or anything like that, or exercises, that is perfect for you. Dorico.com will take you to their page on Steinberg's website. And I can't say enough good things about them. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. 
After several years of planning, I'm so happy that my course, Beginner's Classical Bass, is out on Discover Double Bass. This course is made up of 66, yes, that's a lot, <laughs> video lessons which cover a wide range of topics on classical double bass starting from taking your bass out of the case which is very fun <laughs> to film and Jeff Chalmers of Discover Double Bass and I have a great blooper reel about that and leading to different bow strokes such as staccato and portato the topics also include posture simple scales and arpeggios left hand technique bowing technique simple pieces which are fun to play practice tips and much more you can learn more through the link in the show notes or just visit discoverdoublebass.com slash Jason Heath I, I, you know, I think I played the proto sonata for my junior recital <laughs> for many oh, de yeah. decades ago. I like that yeah. phrase you use, trouble based recital. Is that a, or is that a common phrase? I don't know that I've heard no. that. Yeah. No, I'm just, I just make stuff up left and right, Jason. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's my MO. <laughs> <laughs> it's my MO, but it, but you know, a lot of bass recitals are, and, and bass is one of the few instruments. This is an argument I made to my string colleagues at Lamont. I said, you know, bass is pretty much the only instrument that plays all of their recitals in the treble clef and does none of their paid work, you know, in the treble clef. Um, with the, my, my Basil Vendries, our viola professor argued with me a little bit. He's like, well, you know, we, we play up really high. And I'm like, Basil, no, it's the, the proportion is really skewed. If you take a typical bass recital that's, you know, above the G harmonic for the majority of the time, and then you and then you have them go to their job site and do their work on the base. It's it doesn't relate at all. Yeah. Um, and so we're practicing a skill which is wonderful, and the repertoire is great, and I love it, and I love doing it. But but we need to have some balance. Yeah. We need yeah. to have some balance. Yeah. Is there any other instrument that's that's like that in terms of repertoire? I'm trying to think. B uh, bassoon doesn't hang out in the upper register through all its rep, does it? No. I don't think so. Trumpet, no. not really. No. Yeah. Wow. I mean, the, the closest I can get to a, a similar thought process is really percussion. So, and, and, but that's more in terms of melody versus uh, rhythm. So a, a, a typical percussion recital though, is still different than bass. My husband played um, very much percussive pieces on his recital and he played melodic pieces like Bach on the marimba. So they even do a better job than, than the bass world does, I think of approaching uh, you know, making sure that, that the skills overlap as well as they should. So, and I'm, I'm not trying to knock, you know, the traditional um, um, schools and programs out there. I, I, obviously, they do great. They do wonderful work. This is just an alternative, um, you know, for the, for the, um, for the musically curious, I guess, is what I would, would say in terms of beyond just traditional, the way the traditional bass studio is approached. Well, I think it's exciting to see people trying something new and like now is now is a good time in many ways uh, for sure. I was talking to Nicholas Walker uh, maybe a month ago or so about what he's been doing at Ithaca College and trying to rethink, you know, trying to uh, take the benefits of not being able to see people in person and more recording and that kind of thing. And and now that we're however many months beyond when we last talked, like how is how is the actual uh, working with students process been for you? Have you have you been remote completely, or have you done any in person anything in oh, Colorado yet? We were, yeah, no, we were lucky. We we got to be in person till basically today with with Lamont School of Music. Yeah, okay. Um, we had to pivot, start pivoting to remote last week because it was Colorado's getting kind of out of control. Um, so we were very very lucky and. Um, we had enough space, man, the brain damage those administrators must have had to do to like <laughs> make sure everyone could get a room and leave the room for a certain amount of time. I mean, it was really insane. Um, but the Lamont students, I'm so proud of them. They were awesome. They wore their masks. They didn't go drinking. They, you know, well, maybe they did, but they did it safely. Um, and they just did, they were so aware of what a rare opportunity it was for them in their program to be able to get together. I remember I, one time I had to come down in a chamber group I was coaching because they weren't um, meeting regularly enough, in my opinion. And, um, and I said, you know, you all are playing a lot more than I am, you know, a lot more. You get to play live with other people. And um, that's not something, I mean, I get to do, a, a, I've done a fair amount of it, but that's not something that many of us professionals are even getting to do. So not only is, do I want you to have a little bit of gratitude, but you should take advantage of this time because we're so much less overwhelmed with our own work. Um, 
But yeah, it's and, and I haven't minded the Zoom thing. I've got all my setup now. I've got everything just how I want it. The microphones, the ear, you know, the every the huge monitor so I don't kill my neck. I mean, I just, you know, I just decided to make it as good as possible. And oh, and that's the other thing I forgot. Um, we have a wonderful um, computer music guy who's getting us set up with um, Netty McNetface. I don't know if you know that program. No, what is that? Netty McNetface. Netface, if you've heard of Jack Trip, so Jack oh, yeah, Trip sure. is one yeah, of them. Yeah. yeah. So Nettie McNetface is just easier. It's it's basically the same thing, open source software. Um, and it's just e- a little bit easier to navigate through, takes less complicated setup. And the um, latency is under, I think, 22 milliseconds. Wow. So, okay. um, and that's not enough. You know, people, musicians won't notice it. There's a great a video of Mark Dresser out there. I don't know if you've seen it doing a, a test for, I think it was Jack Trip. Yeah. Well, I went down this Jack. It's great that you bring that up. I went down this massive Jack Trip rabbit hole because Gary Carr <laughs> emailed me and said, have you heard of Jack Trip? And I said, yeah. no, I haven't. But but I feel like if Gary Carr is asking, I owe it to the base world to find out. And my yeah. conclusion after talking to several people is uh, what a cool technology this particular Mm -hmm. no no user interface isn't quite ready for prime time i couldn't see like you know convincing a one of my couple students to like figure this out you know and port forwarding so but this netty mcnet face i will which is a good name too i will will check that out it's an awesome name yeah you really need a a conrad kuhn who's our computer music guy uh, composition teacher and runs the new music ensemble you need a guy like that in your in your world to um you need to buy him beer pizzas or whatever it (laughs) takes to get him to help you as a matter of fact i have an appointment with them to to get it set up again um because it isn't if you're not a computer jock it's it's it's, it can be a challenge Mm -hmm. um especially jack trip but netty mcneff face is a a little bit easier well i'm looking forward i mean if 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 we have to stay remote with my students i've already warned them i said you know get your ethernet cable because we're going we're going and um we're going to play together i don't care what i don't care what so well, it's ex- it's exciting to see developments on that front. You know, I talking to uh, Michael Dessen, who is has been using Jacktrip for a long time, and and I was uh, <laughs> talking to these folks a couple months ago. Uh, th- I think it was one professor working part time on Jacktrip. You know, every once in a while, I think they have something like twenty people working on it now. And I went to their website yeah. recently; they got a whole Jacktrip foundation. They're working on a user interface, so it's exciting mm-hmm. to see those developments. And it's it's cool how it opens up possibilities that we can take advantage of beyond the pandemic, you know, and and, and just watching what bring up Mark Dressel, what he's been doing since I think 2009 or something like that with deep tones for peace, connecting with people in Europe across the way. And even though there is latency, more latency than, than you'd be on stage or anything like that, it doesn't mean you can't collaborate together. It's just a different type. You're not going to play like 280 beats per minute bop probably, but you can have a musical experience and to be able to beam into South Korea or, Mm -hmm. you know, um, you name the place. It's it's uh, right. it's really cool what that opens up. And then if you're close, you can have latency like you're describing, 22 milliseconds. Right. I mean, I think there's probably more latency from the principal basis to the back of the section. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's it's um, yeah. As long as you're within you know four or five hundred miles and you've got your Ethernet and you've got you know pretty good um, setup. Um, yeah. You can you can you'll not notice the latency. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah. Wow. Well, I can't wait to see how this all takes shape. Are these six tracks? Are you? Is this something that you're that you're planning for? Well, I guess probably for this academic year, right? Is this something that I am? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Coming up this academic year, um, I'm going to even offer it to one of my seniors this 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 next recital. See see if they're interested. But um, and the nice thing too, I, I think it's nice for bass, and I've also kind of been uh, arguing for this forever, is that all of the auditions at Lamont are going to be online, uh, virtual recorded um and it's just i mean my part of the country is part of the problem getting here with the bass or playing someone else's bass i i just hope that bass players can still take advantage of that post pandemic um especially with the technology getting as good as it is and a lot of people having good equipment um yeah so so it's it's definitely for next year i'm i i'm in the process of talking my colleagues into a graduate program that's a little bit similar so that we can have something more than just an orchestral certificate which is what we have or a performer certificate which is what we have right now um so yeah i'm 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 excited about it and and 
I, you know, one of the things I took away from the Women in uh, Classical Music Symposium, they had Deborah Border was like the keynote speaker and she, Deborah Border, the former um, LA Phil CEO and now the New York Phil CEO. And she was talking about the audition process and how she would like to see it change to add more um, diversity of the experience so that you got to know the person beyond just their playing. Now, there's problems with that, especially in in certain instruments that are, you know, a little have been typically tougher for women, like bass, like trumpet, like percussion, tuba. Um, so it, I, I don't know if she's going to be able to get that past a lot of orchestra committees right away. But this kind of analysis of players is coming. It's coming. And so the soft skills, what they call soft skills, that I'm also trying to incorporate into these tracks by having the web presence that you develop and by having the capstone project where you have to basically defend your, you know, your whole year. (laughs) Those are about the soft skills. Those are about, you know, how you and I talk and how people present at base conventions and all of these different things. Um, so I'm I'm excited about that aspect of it in general too because that's not something I could really write down you know oh here's a track on soft skills you, you can't do that right it's just something that I know in my growth as a musician has been super important especially dealing with a, a you know a cooperatively run orchestra so yes I'm I'm super excited I'm sorry you can probably tell that yeah no for sure <laughs> and, and it's it. It's, you know, it's not that I wasn't excited before to do the teaching. I love my students and I love teaching, but I really feel like this is for me something I can really get behind in a way um, that's that's fresh and new for me. And so I'm really looking forward to it. And I hope I hope to get some great folks to audition and to welcome in, into the program. Well, please keep me posted. I think it's really cool to see you innovating in terms of this. It's so easy for uh, for us to fall into the the trap of just kind of doing the same thing like we did when we were growing up, like we've done every year. Mm-hmm. But, you know, no matter if you just look at what people end up doing, the percentage of people from whatever school going into a full-time orchestral career is not super high. You know, maybe in the single digits, we, we don't even need to measure it. But and even if you do, land, like you're in a full time in a full time orchestra but you do so many other things and like you were saying at the w- when we first started talking the the joy and satisfaction you get from all those activities i think that's so uh, that yeah. pretty much universal across the board i remember talking to michael Hovnani and the chicago symphony y- decades ago at this point and him saying people it's the thing on the side that kind of keeps you going not that you don't love the orchestra and playing in the bass section or the violin mm-hmm. section or whatever but it's those other things that keep you going so even if you do you are in that 3%, 5%, whatever, that lands a full-time orchestral job, you're probably going to want to do things anyway, but you're much more likely to have some sort of portfolio career and those soft skills are the real mm-hmm. skills. Obviously, so is bass playing or whatever instrument you play, but it's really cool. Right. I, I, I like the way, um, I, 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 I love, I'm not surprised that you're innovating, but I really like what you've put together here. I think it's super cool. Well, thanks, Jason. And thanks, thanks for, you know, being willing to talk to me about it. I'm, um, I really appreciate it. I appreciate, man, all the stuff you do for us getting, you're just our own personal PR machine, man, uh. for bass playing. It's just, <laughs> it's just awesome. Uh, we, we, you can't buy that kind of, kind of PR. So, um, it's really, it's really wonderful. It's good to have a chance to talk about it. Well, I, I love having you on. You're becoming a regular guest, which is great. <laughs> I, I, let's, let's keep it going. Uh, give me a, give me an update once you get, get further on into, um, uh, <laughs> into the program and uh, let me know the next time we can travel in a more normal way next let me oh, know the yeah. next time you're in in san francisco and we'll uh i we'll for show you sure around. will and i hope we may have a base convention this summer i mean i know, we'll, I know. I, uh, fingers crossed right Finger, fingers crossed i'm from d- just three hours away from lincoln so i my mom would appreciate oh. me <laughs> coming home but i also am realistic so i'm not bl- buying my plane ticket yet but i'm i'm hopeful <laughs> me neither i'm i'm hopeful too I'm more hopeful than I was. Let's put it that okay. way. <laughs> okay. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's good talking to you. Yeah. Thanks for hanging out. I appreciate this. I will get this out uh, relatively soon here. I'll link up to everything. Um, okay. The- 
Susan, thank you so much. These are the sort of conversations and check out definitely all the details in the show notes as SusanCahill.com is her website and we've got all that linked up plus past podcast appearances and I just love having Susan on the show. I love having people back time and time again. I definitely have never thought of this podcast as a one and done deal. Susan is in the running for most frequent guest, although I think John Grillo will probably always hold the most frequent appearances guest since he co-hosted like 30 of these with me back in the dark ages, I say lovingly, of the podcast. And you know, the, oops, I bumped the mic, but I'm not going to edit. <laughs> um, I give myself a C at best in terms of how I'm handling the global pandemic personally. Uh, C to C minus, let's say. I'm not in a ball on the floor bemoaning life and I am so fortunate compared to the positions of so many other people and I just I count my blessings I do some gratitude journaling uh, whenever I I muster up the the organization to do that or the motivation to do that rather and but part of the beauty of doing this podcast on a regular basis for me has been talking to people like Susan and seeing people innovate, come up with new ideas, make the best of things. It gives me more of a stoic outlook on how things are right now. I part, part living in a, San Francisco, it, there are positives and negatives to living anywhere, cer certainly here. And the fact that we haven't even really begun to open and then what little was open has shut back down hard for who knows how long. And all these servers that we know in our neighborhood and, and uh, who knows what's happening with them. And there are just so many... I don't know I'm stating the obvious here, but there are so many dark things going on and chaotic things uh, in all of 2020. But uh, and even the last few weeks, I, I, I get real dark and you might not realize that. And I'm never acting in anything I'm doing in terms of the podcast or doing a video or whatever, but I get dark and I'm generally a positive person. And this has been a hard uh, and again, not for reasons that are legitimate. I, I, I'm not truly suffering. The, it's only mental suffering at the at being trapped inside and watching the world and, and that sort of thing. But it's an extremely long way of saying that these conversations have been really good for my mental health because I see and I can I can uh, connect with and and understand and get inspired by what Susan's doing, what Nicholas Walker is doing, what other people in higher education are doing. You're going to be hearing a podcast next week with Zach Vandergraff, who's an elementary general music teacher. How the, uh, yeah, I think I said that right. How the heck do you teach that? Well, ever, that sounds like a terrifying job to me, but during a global pandemic, well, he's finding a way. So people that have the grit that are innovating and, and navigating their way through and creating new things along the way through this current time, I find very inspiring. Okay, enough of that. I'll try not to get dark uh, in these outros. That wasn't that dark, hopefully. But I would like to thank everybody. Thank you for listening. Thank you to the sponsors who are on board. I really appreciate them. And it's really cool to get new sponsors. If you've listened to the podcast for a while, you'll hear people come and go and come back and that sort of thing. And I just shut off all sponsorship at the beginning of the pandemic because I was realizing that the last thing these companies need to do is be supporting a double base podcast. But we're in this for the long haul, apparently. And there are people that are, again, finding the silver lining, investing. So thank you to Dorico, Ear Trumpet Labs, Practisma, and Modacity, four companies that I really dig. And I have done re views on two of those fairly extensively more to come on dorico and actually a podcast episode on dorico and then also i am reviewing the nadine microphone from ear trumpet labs i am um, these reviews these this is a video review uh these reviews take some time for me to film and uh, it's just time to sort of think through i'm kind of uh new to the game in terms of that but thank you to them boy this outro is getting long okay let me sh uh give a shout out to the team michael cooper steve hinchy mitch mooring trevor jones krista copper and theme music from this podcast that you hear at the intro and outro is Eric Hochberg and me jamming back in the mid 2000s. EricHochberg.com is his website or is it EricHochbergMusic.com? Oh crap. I can't remember. Look up Eric Hochberg. You'll find him. He's a great guy. And we have an intern coming on board in the beginning of 2021. We'll be sharing our experiences working through that. Uh, Trevor Jones and I who work on the podcast together along with other people, which you just heard, but we're, we're sketching out what that internship will look like. That's something that we will likely continue to do going forward. So if you 
are a university professor and you're looking for uh, an opportunity for a student to get some hands-on experience in a small company, a, a digital a media company, whatever the heck you want to call this thing, and, and work with me, work with Trevor, work with the other people on the team, uh, reach out. Feedback at ContraBasedConversations.com, and we're booked up for the spring semester, but we'll probably be doing more of this, likely be doing more of this going forward, and we'll have a model that we can share with people because we're building it as we go. I am, again, quite long-winded, too long-winded, but thank you if you made it to the end of these unedited, <laughs> unedited outros. Uh, and we will see you again soon for more life on the Lord of the Spectrum. 